Good evening and welcome to the February 22nd, 2021 Menlo Park Planning Commission. Um, calling the meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. Uh, roll call tonight, we have Commissioner Barnes, Commissioner Ducardi, Commissioner Doran, Commissioner Kale, cleaning his lens, very good. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy, uh, Commissioner Tate, and I am Henry Riggs, your chair. Uh, we start our evening with reports and announcements from staff. Um, is it Mr. Parada tonight or Ms. Sandemeyer? Ms. Sandemeyer. Yes. Good evening, Chair Riggs and Commissioners. Um, so tomorrow night, the City Council will uh, hear an item to consider modifications to the street closure and temporary outdoor use permit program. Um, that concludes my reports and announcements, but I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Any questions for our staff this evening? Like, why is my monitor stuck? There we go. <clears throat> All right, uh, no questions. So we will start our evening with um, our item D on the agenda is the public comment period. <clears throat> Under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject not listed on the agenda and items listed under the consent calendar. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda and therefore <clears throat> the commissioner commission cannot respond to agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. So if you would like to make a public comment, you will see on the right side of your screen, the go to webinar control panel and look for the hand icon. If you click on that hand icon, that will tell staff that someone out there would like to make a comment and we will connect you immediately. <clears throat> um, so Mr. Tapia, do we see any indications of public comment tonight on non-agendized items. Good evening, Chair, Planning Commission members, uh, and members of the public. I, this time I'm not seeing any public comments, but we can give it a second as usual, see if any come in. All right, if, uh, if we don't see any um, flashing hand icons there at submission control, um, we will close the public comment period and move on to our consent calendar. Tonight we have uh, two items on the consent calendar. One is the approval of minutes and transcript from our January 11 meeting. And item E2 is an architectural control request by Paul Turek for 2440 Sand Hill Road. And I'll read the context of that. This is a request for architectural control to modify the exterior of an existing three-story commercial building in the C1C, Administrative Professional and Research Restrictive Zoning District. The modifications involve extending the existing balcony deck and constructing new deck footings and piers, wood deck framing and metal guardrails. Does anyone on the commission <clears throat> wish to pull an item or discuss an item? All right, seeing no indication, um, then do I have a motion on the consent calendar this evening? Mr. Ducardi? I'll have move a... to approve as submitted. Thank you. Do we have a second? Mr. Kale, thank you. Second. All right, we have a motion and second to approve the consent calendar. Um, all those in favor, please uh, indicate with your hand. That is unanimous this evening uh, with all seven commissioners present.
Moving on to item F, this is uh, our public hearing tonight. <clears throat> we have one item, and that is a use permit by uh, the uh, request is from the city of Menlo Park for 1395 Chrysler Drive. This is a request to renew a previously approved use permit for hazardous materials to install a new diesel emergency generator associated with a new stormwater pump station which is located in the PF, that's Public Facilities Zoning District. The project previously received approval in 2017 for an architectural control to construct a new stormwater pump station <clears throat> to replace an existing pump station and for a use permit for hazardous materials to install a new diesel emergency generator associated with the stormwater pump station, the hazardous materials being the diesel tank. <clears throat> Um, so, uh, Ms. Sandemeyer, do we have a report um, to introduce on this project? So, through the chair, if I may, um, this is Tom Smith, senior planner. Good evening, Tom. Good evening Chair Riggs and commissioners. Um, I don't have any updates to the report since it was published, but I'm happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Do we have any questions? Um, we'll note we do have, the commission does have a letter or two, or two from um, uh, residents. Uh, Mr. Ducardi. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Um, given that this has been uh, several years uh, in in process and the original decision to have a uh, diesel generator to uh, supply the power, um, over the course of that time, have you looked into alternative um, sources of power like a battery operated or some kind of renewable energy option? And what did you find in looking at the cost of those alternatives? Mr. Smith, I think this is directed to you. Yes, um, so I'm actually going to turn it over to Eric Hinckley, who is a member of our utilities division staff, and he can answer that question for you. Good evening, Chair Riggs, uh, commissioners. Like Tom said, my name is Eric Hinckley. I'm an associate engineer in uh, our engineering division. So in the intervening two years since we got our original use permit approved, uh, we did take a look at uh, battery backup power. Um, when we evaluated it, we determined that really the site available to us for that type of facility is just too small. Um, this project, uh, the lot size is the same as our existing pump station. We're now trying to squeeze in a, a much larger wet well, um, an additional pump, larger pumps at that. Uh, electrical room and uh, the room that we have set aside for the emergency backup power. So the the size of the battery system we would need in order to power these high horsepower pumps that we, we just determined that we didn't have the available space to do it. Um, one option that we are evaluating in tandem with our maintenance division is since we are going to be using a emergency diesel generator is the use of renewable diesel fuels, which is an emerging technology of diesel fuel that has a much smaller carbon footprint than standard petroleum-based diesel products. Thank you for that. If I may, through the chair, just to follow up. So the, the issue is the um, space constraint as opposed to a price constraint in terms of sort of capital and operating costs. Is that correct? That's the primary concern. Um, the other thing we're concerned about is being a stormwater pump station. We consider it a life safety facility. We want to make sure that we always have the ability to run that backup power when needed. Um, if you'll consider kind of what's going on in Houston, the or uh, excuse me, Texas with their energy issues, you know th this generator is likely to be needed uh, concurrent with a storm where the pumps are also needed. So we want to be able to make sure that this backup generator can work all the time, not be reliant on being uh, refreshed and regenerated by an electrical grid power supply to refresh those batteries. So part of 
our consideration in, in addition to uh, the site constraints is just to make sure that this pump station is 100% reliable all the time. Uh, something else that we consider is that the generator is not going to run very frequently. Uh, the reality is that it's only going to be needed, uh, like I said, concurrent with a storm event. So it's highly unlikely it's going to be minimal when it's needed in an emergency situation. Uh, as far as testing of the generator, that's going to be a max of about 15 minutes per month just to make sure that the equipment is exercised and confirm readiness for an emergency situation. Yeah, I understand the second part of your answer. I don't understand the first part. Essentially, the reliability question is the trade-off between uh, enough uh, battery storage that gives you more than 300 gallons equivalent of diesel fuel because you also have similar concerns with if you had to operate for an extended period of time with being able to get supply, diesel supply. There's also a whole host of other um, systems issues that can go wrong with a diesel supplied power source relative to a battery supplied power source. I'm not really getting into the, I don't want to argue the the merits between the two, but I, but but that's the consideration, right? Is not simply, you know, your question about reliability is in there's a trade off in your assessment about risk. And there's certainly a risk on the diesel side as well. Is that right? I would agree. But we are also a 300 gallon tank, you know, at full load could run for up to eight hours. And the city has infrastructure available to resupply the diesel uh, fuel in that pump station, uh, not only through contract vendors, but also. Uh, our city staff maintains a refueling capability. All right. Well, I, I, A, I appreciate you being here, and thank you for the clarification, and thanks for the work on this. Um, no further questions for me. Thank you, Chair Reeves. Thank you, and you, your follow-up question also uh, addressed my question. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, this is uh, relatively straightforward um, and some of us uh, did see this three years ago uh, in terms of format I believe uh, so um, are there any uh, uh, any other questions of staff first all right and then I will uh, seeing none I'll open this up for public comment um, again if you would like to make a comment on a project you look to the right of your screen uh, with a go to webinar control panel and look for the hand icon. Uh, click on that and we will know immediately that you would like to speak. Um, so this would be the appropriate time to uh, make that gesture if you would like to speak on the issue of uh, approval of the <clears throat> use of diesel as part of our backup system. So Mr. Tapia, do we see any signs of uh, interest in speaking. Good evening, Chair. I'm not seeing any comments for this item as of yet. It has been a while, but um, having observed the 1998 flood, um, uh, in, including um, not far from Chrysler Drive, where the uh, <coughs> Freeway flooded. Um, we do know that this is uh, this is needed from time to time, and um, unlike some levels of government, we would like to be prepared. All right. Uh, lacking any indication for public speaking, um, I'll ask for uh, any comments from uh, the dais or any motion to. Uh, approve or other motion. Mr. Kale. Uh, I actually had a, a few questions. I'm not sure, is, is the city the applicant here? Yes. Okay. Um, I was curious if there's a landscape plan to go with this. I didn't see one in the drawings. Good question. Uh, Eric, what can you tell us? Or Tom? So the, the landscape would have been covered under the architectural control approval previously. And um, it, that that was a plan that is essentially a lot of um, low grasses, uh, not many types of ornamental plantings um, to try to 
keep the focus on the actual structure itself, which is pretty unique design to it. Um, so I don't know if anyone from the applicant team wishes to expand on that, but it would have been covered under the previous architecture control. Now this is uh, Steve Buckles, the architect, and uh, we're using the same landscape architect, Tuilo and Associates, that did the Constitution uh, project. And uh, it is a continuation of those same landscaped elements in front of the pump station. So I thought there was a plan, uh, but maybe it hasn't been updated in a while. And a, a follow-up question. Um, I was curious about that and, and related to that, is there um, um, lighting in the landscape? Because one of the, one yeah. of the uh, images showed um, a night view, which is very nice. It highlighted the sculptural aspect of it, but it was, wasn't clear if there were. We haven't, the yeah, we haven't even started those drawings yet, but the intent is to have the lighting, uh, just like the rendering showed, uh, just in the landscaping to uplight uh, pieces, uh, corners of the structure at a low level. And, and again, uh, we haven't actually got that design done yet, but that's the intent. Okay. And otherwise, the the project is the, from the exterior at least is the same as it was previously, exterior and the landscape. Yes, we've been working very hard with the city and the city engineers to maintain the same uh, geometric shape that we had uh, two years ago. Okay, thank you. So um, I'll go ahead and make a motion. Um, actually, I, I had thought this was project was already built at this point. I thought. <laughs> I was looking forward to going out to seeing it sometime, so I'm glad it's back in the mix. Um, so I'll pr uh, propose to uh, approve the um, the use permit as proposed in the uh, in the staff report, um, and it's a little uh, unfortunate that we have to use diesel. And, and by my calculations, at eight hours, that's over 40 gallons an hour to fire the, that system up. And I'm glad it's a backup only. Um, so that's my my motion. All right, thank you. Do I have a second, Mr. Barnes? I'll register that as a second. Um, yes, please. If there's uh, unless there's further discussion, uh, Mr. Ducardi. Yeah, I'm going to vote no, and I just want to explain why. Um, you know, we are seeing many of these that have come before us now, and, and from developers, and I am. Um, conscious of the decisions, uh, like you know, the last time we looked at one of the developments out in the same area, for a developer and the need for space and to be able to work off of diesel. I appreciate the comment and the um, answering the questions from staff, and I appreciate the look into biodiesel and alternative fuels as those become more available. Um, but this is a different project. This is a public project with public dollars. Menlo Park is in the position to lead, and this is changing very, very rapidly. And I, I think it's incumbent upon us to continue to look and to continue to press to not use fossil fuels. The irony of using fossil fuels um, for uh, generating power in response to uh, needs that are happening because we've been burning fossil fuels is just too much to bear on this. And so therefore I'll be voting no and I would encourage future projects to be up to date and to continually stress test the opportunity to actually use alternative um, energy that doesn't put us in this position. Um, and that's it's not to take anything away from the staff diligence and the work in this project, which I really appreciate, but that's why I'm voting no. Understood. And I will note that uh, I also look forward to the time when um, batteries are reliable enough, uh, are cost effective, and their life cycle effects on the environment have been resolved. I think that is soon. Uh, I think the market will reflect that because frankly, I think that uh, particularly uh, a developer like Tarleton Properties, which owns and keeps its buildings, is going to find that the diesel generators are dinosaurs and that uh, the electric battery packs will be the reality of the future. And I hope that becomes clear soon. Uh, and that uh, particularly in Menlo Park, as Mr. Dicardi points out, um, we will be in a position to lead that change rather than follow. Um, 
but on this particular one, we have a motion and a second, and I will call for the vote, um, starting with uh, Mr. Barnes. Yes. And uh, Mr. Ducardi, you registered a nay. Nay. Mr. Doran? Yes. And Mr. Kale? Yes. Ms. Kennedy? That's a nay. Ms. Tate? That's a nay. And uh, just given the technology of today, I am going to support staff's decision, knowing that they at least have looked into the alternative and hoping, as Mr. Ducardi points out, that in the future we can leave, lead. Um, so I have um, four votes to three to approve. The approves are Barnes, Doran, Kale, and Riggs, and opposed are Ducardi, Kennedy, and Tate. All right, and with that, we move on to item G, regular business. We have one item in regular business this evening. <clears throat> that is an architectural control and below market rate housing agreement. Applicant Chase Rapp for 1162 to 1170 El Camino Real. And Ms. Khan, um, do you have any updates? Good evening, uh, commissioners and members of the public. Staff does not have any uh, updates to the staff report. However, staff did receive three correspondence since publication of the staff report, two of which have been provided to the commissioners and uploaded in the revised agenda. The third correspondence was from a Ms. Kate Powers to the applicant so that they could include an art installation project. I have uh, provided the address to the applicant team to get in touch with Ms. Powers. Um, in attendance, we have the city's consulting architect, Mr. Arnold Mamarella, who can assist with uh, answering any questions that the commissioners may have. Uh, and so will I. Thank you very much. Wonderful, and welcome, Mr. Amarello. Um, so let us start with uh, any questions <coughs> for uh, staff or the applicant. All right, lacking that, um, and uh, are either Mr. Rapp or Mr. Hurst present? And did you want to? say anything about the project or introduce the situation yeah good evening uh chairman riggs and uh members of the planning commission uh, brady and myself both want to thank all of you uh for uh being patient with this project uh we know it's been two and a half years since uh we started this project and it's been hard for all of us to to wrap our hands around the complexities but we are very excited to be here tonight um hopefully being able to bring this project to fruition and uh add this to uh, another project in Menlo Park. Uh, this would be our ninth project, and uh, we're very excited for it to be an all housing project. We know that the city of Menlo Park has a goal uh, to add more housing supply specifically in uh, the downtown specific plan area. And uh, not only uh, it being a housing project, we're excited for a third of it to be uh, BMR. And um, we hope that we can get your support behind this project and continue to add more value to uh, the downtown. So thank you very much. And uh, tonight we have our historical consultant with us as well as our general counsel and our design team. So if you have any questions from any of them or myself, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. All right, thank you. Um, anyone, uh, any commission members have any questions before we ask for public comment? Right. Mr. Rapp, I think your project is felt to be somewhat familiar, which is a good thing. Um, let's go ahead and call for public comment at this time. If you would like to comment on this project, again, 
look at your GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of your screen. There is a hand icon, and if you click on that hand icon, it will tell staff that you would like to speak. Um, we um, offer three minutes uh, to each individual that would like to speak on the subject of the project. Chair Riggs, um, this is Jennifer Rank on behalf of the project applicants. We did want to do a, a short presentation before we do public comment. I, I don't know if it's the right time to do that now. Oh, I think that would be fine. Yes, I'm okay. sorry. I thought uh, uh, when Chase concluded that you guys were nope. done. No it problem. Be an update. Toby, can you take it away? Yes, thanks, Jen. Um, I'm just getting myself situated here. Hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. Um, yes. You guys want to give me uh, keyboard and mouse control? Hey, Toby, this is Leo. You should have it now by using your keyboard. Okay, great. I can see that. <clears throat> And I will try to, oh, it looks like it's probably full screen. Sorry, I'm seeing all the other people. So um, I will jump in. Uh, commissioners uh, and general public, thank you so much uh, for hearing our presentation this evening. Um, we've, uh, we've, we've all seen this project a few times, so I will try to be uh, brief. Uh, but we did want to bounce through a few slides uh, in anticipation that there uh, may be some comments directed towards the design or certainly questions that we could uh, field related to the design. I also understand that there are um, some complex issues here and a number of uh, different topics that we may want to review. So again, I will try to be brief and uh, move ourselves quickly through uh, the, the presentation. Uh, so uh, again, thank you for hearing us this evening. We're excited to be here. This is a long time in the making. Um, we're looking at the, the front of this uh, exciting new project uh, as viewed from the El Camino Real. Uh, and so we'll uh, jump in here. Oops, see if my keyboard is working. I'm not sure I have controls. I'm trying to advance the slide. Um, Sorry, Toby. Let me exit out of full screen. Maybe this will help. Okay, go ahead and take control again. Okay, let me try to put this into full screen mode and see if that goes back in a way that I can advance. Yep, there we go. Uh, great. Uh, well, we, we wanted to just kind of start out by taking ourselves back to the origins of the project when we uh, were first uh, undertaking this uh, a design with the commission. Uh, this was back in uh, March of 2019. Uh, just so as a, a quick recap, this was a, a little bit of where we started. Uh, the project's description and, and goals were are, are still very similar. This was uh, originally proposed as a nine unit project with nine spaces, uh, parking spaces. We were uh, proposing a more modern aesthetic using uh, some stone on the on the facade. We had some balconies on the front. Uh, we did hear from the commission that the construction methodology and in, in being built off site was perhaps dominant to the aesthetic uh, that the balconies facing the street uh, potentially can get cluttered with, you know, grills and bikes and such uh, that we needed to look at the rear yard a little bit more closely with respect to privacy and screening. Uh, and then also to respond to some comments we had received from the neighbors regarding the function of the rear yard and uh, producing a, a design that was a little bit less lively or, or a little bit less about gathering spaces to become more of a, a quiet private garden of sorts. Um, that brought us to our second study session uh, in October of 2019. Uh, this was the proposal that we had brought forward to that uh, uh, hearing. Um, this again represents a similar scope of nine units. We have nine parking spaces. Uh, we work closely with Arnold and the city to craft the design aesthetic with which is a bit more integrated to neighborhood context, a little bit more pedestrian oriented, uh, a little bit more of the uh, kind of storefront aesthetic with respect to uh, amassing that uh, maybe broke down to be more familiar to the size and scale of buildings historically on the El Camino. Uh, and so some of the comments that we had received at that time were really to work through the facade to conform to the modulation requirements under the specific plan. 
um, in our uh, responses to those comments and, and in, in, in an evolution of the design, uh, we started to really look more closely at a pedestrian scale, uh, looking closely at some of the plantings along the street, the potential for a canopy, uh, trying to really articulate the forms of the building, again, in, in conformance with the specific plan requirements. Um, so this is as the projects has evolved, uh, the design aesthetic has been, again, more integrated to kind of neighborhood context. The divisions of the building are based on proportion, partly from the scale of the adjoining structures, as well as some of the uh, design vocabulary, uh, incorporating some awnings, looking at the division of the uh, windows using Munton that was a bit more familiar to a traditional aesthetic. Uh, introducing some sloped roof elements in the two adjoining flank, the flanking forms of, uh, of uh, adjacent to our major uh, form, um, integrating a more traditional palette of materials, uh, incorporating some siding brick, um, a little stucco, uh, and uh, looking also at possibly bringing in some window boxes and some planted elements uh, on the facade, again, looking at the more sort of residential scale and character of the building. Um, in this design, we had also removed the balconies from the front facade in promotion of privacy and to really allow for a very clean aesthetic and a uncluttered facade uh, in terms of the uh, occupants and the, the long-term use of the, of the property. Um, we did move balconies to the rear. Uh, we've addressed the privacy issues between each of the units, uh, as well as increasing landscape screening um, along the uh, rear property line. Uh, just a quick little sectional study here to show some of the uh, relationships between the rear of this structure and the building to uh, to the back of this uh, proposal. Uh, there is about 40 feet uh, adjacent from uh, window opening to window opening between the structures. Uh, you can see a little bit of the planting scheme, which is proposed uh, down near the garden areas of the project. Um, as well as the existing trees, which are currently slated to remain. Uh, they provide a large screening mechanism for uh, the condos at the rear uh, facing into the subject property. So as again, the current proposal stands, uh, the building still has nine units, uh, the sidewalk uh, frontage has been resolved through our work with the city. Uh, we have clarified our parking configurations and updated the layouts per some of the maneuvering requirements in coordination with traffic. Uh, the BMR units have been integrated as I'm sure we'll talk about this evening. Uh, we've removed the front awning as it was deemed to be inconsistent with the modulation requirements of the facade under the specific plan. Um, so just a quick tour of the project. This is the project site uh, we're all familiar with on El Camino, one property uh, to the south of Elk Grove. Uh, here's the existing conditions. You can see the two structures uh, which will be removed for the project proposal. A little existing site diagram showing the existing two-story office retail in the uh, northwest corner. Uh, the northeast corner is uh, another small uh, one-story structure. The existing uh, trees you can see around the periphery of the property to the north side. Uh, of course, the one-story office building also to the south side of the property will be removed. Here's the project proposal in its site plan, uh, new street trees on El Camino, of course, with some short-term bike parking. Um, our driveway is located to uh, the south side of the subject parcel. Uh, property is basically uh, being built up to the edge of our sidewalk limitations, uh, as well as uh, towards the rear where we have maintained the more or less 20-foot uh, garden space at the rear of the property. Just to bounce a little quickly through here, uh, the parking's been updated, as I mentioned, uh, a bit just to account for some maneuvering clearances and to gain some compliance with code. Uh, you can see the lobby area accessing uh, to access from the center of the property. There is a small lounge for the residents. Uh, to the left, of course, the recycling and electrical uh, facilities uh, to the uh, adjacent side of that lounge. Um, I should actually go back a quick second just to oops, uh, make a note here. 
that the, um, sorry, Commissioners, let me go back to slides. Uh, I just want to point out that the uh, garden is accessed from the small staircase. You can see to the uh, left side of the garage area, that stair is accessed from the floors above uh, and comes down to a door which you open up and you can go right out into that landscaped area. Uh, also in response to comments we had received prior, uh, the rear of that garage is open so that you can see through to the uh, garden area, so we're hoping to create an invitation or an ongoing invitation for the residents of the building to uh, really use that uh, open space and garden area at the rear of the project. Um, so three BMR units were, of course, confirmed by housing uh, in November. Um, the project uh, accounts for one very low income unit. Uh, these are, of course, also accounting for the carryover BMR units from 506 and 556 Santa Cruz, as Chase represented um, on this particular floor, one of the two, uh, the two bedroom units. Uh, and one bedroom unit um, in, in, are being accounted for. Uh, so we've got a two bedroom and a studio which are being accounted for on floor two. And then on floor three is uh, the one bedroom unit here in the corner. Uh, you can see the unit plans, uh, fairly reasonably typical uh, apartment style units uh, broken into, of course, it's uh, modules for the offsite assembly. Um, just wanted to really quickly show a slide about the uh, previous proposal. Um, this was uh, something that we had worked again with uh, Arnold and the staff to resolve, uh, looking to identify the modulation requirements along the facade, uh, the primary facade being the central section, uh, which has the lounge area for the apartments, uh, the minor modulations on either side of that, and of course, a continuation of the modulation on the uh, what would be the east side of the project. Um, the canopy, again, which we were kind of liking, uh, also was deemed to be um, interrupting the continuity uh, required for the modulation, and so it was removed in our current proposal to get into conformance with the requirements under the specific plan. Uh, in terms of our material palette, uh, we're looking to use a very kind of organic, uh, a soft set of uh, materials, very complementary. Uh, will consist of some soffits uh, using some stained cedar. Uh, we're looking to use James Hardy's Artisan Fiber Cement Board product with a four inch lap. Uh, we do have some exterior sconces, which are, are gonna be down lights uh, on the facade. Uh, the trim, planter boxes, and awnings will be of a dark bronze coated aluminum or powder coated metal. Um, similar for our security screen, which will be a, a rolling screen at the front of the parking area. We're also planning to use a smooth integral color uh, stucco, which will be the white and the uh, sort of beige sections that you see. Uh, the windows are going to be a dark bronze color uh, to match the uh, coated metals, uh, similar for the storefront system, and then using a glazed thin brick uh, from Eglin Butler uh, as part of the uh, facade treatment, particularly on the major modulation and a bit of the wainscoting, uh, which wraps around the base of the uh, storefront. And just a couple quick images uh, looking here from the entry of the garage back towards the lobby area. You can see the uh, modulation at work as well as the uh, small window coverings on the right hand side. Uh, here's a quick image of the rear showing a bit of the planting, uh, the views out of the garage sort of through the vegetation into the garden areas uh, as well as the separation of the balcony units and our proposal for uh, a coated horizontal guardrail system along the back. And I think that might be the last slide, so I will leave it there and uh, happy to entertain any questions. All right, thank you very much. Uh, again, a, a well thought out project. Um, commissioners, any uh, questions for the applicant uh, before we move to public comment? All right, seeing none, um, we will <clears throat> once again take a shot at uh, public comment. Uh, for those of you uh, attending by GoToWebinar, <clears throat> please take note of the hand icon on the side of the GoToWebinar control panel. And uh, if you click on that, it will indicate to staff uh, that uh, you would like to speak on this subject. <clears throat> We do limit each public commenter to three minutes, and this would be the time to address 1162 El Camino Real. So, 
Mr. Tapia, do we have our first commenter? Yes, uh, good evening, Chair, members of the Commission and members of the public. It looks like we have several comments, so I'll go ahead and introduce the comments as they appear on my screen. So the first individual I will introduce is Aiden Stone. Aiden Stone, you should have the ability to activate your microphone now. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So yes, well. uh, we want to we want to say thank you to you guys and thank you to Chase Rap, thank you to Brady First and the whole applicant team. Uh, I'm here with Jack Feldman right now, and uh, we've withdrawn all of our appeals over the years to save the uh, oldest commercial storefront in Menlo Park. It's 125 years old, uh, plus the 54 year old avocado tree in the back garden. <clears throat> we don't want to obstruct their project in any way anymore. Um, they've been more than patient and straightforward with us and have offered to, to, to move the avocado tree uh, to, to, to Jack Feldman's front yard. And we, we want to ensure that the city will participate in helping fulfill that promise of relocating that tree, which is protected under the Menlo Park ordinance. And on a final note, along with the gratitude to uh, Chase and Brady, uh, I think it's safe to say that I, I can speak for, for, for some of the community members who have come forward over the years uh, in, in the effort to save Feldman's uh, books and this building. Uh, and, and even though we know that nothing is permanent, uh, we think it's good to remember the historic building that's going away. And I don't know if some of you guys saw the event that happened in San Francisco yesterday where a 139-year-old building was moved uh, piecemeal uh, to preserve it uh, for historical uh, purposes. Uh, I, I just thought it was it was really remarkable that, that that happened, that they went to the trouble to preserve uh, the patrimony and the, uh, uh, the, the beauty of that building. Uh, and I, I wish that Menlo Park would, would go out of its way to do the same uh, because this building really is special. And, uh, you know, it's good to remember that it was built in 1896 and it was frequented by a lot of people in Menlo Park's history, uh, Mrs. Stanford, um, sent her laundry here, and then the building here was operated by uh, a series of immigrant families uh, that ran it as laundry and then a grocery, and um, thereafter as a doctor's office, an, uh, an orthodontist office, uh, and that in the late 60s it uh, became the East-West Bookstore and was actually run by um, the same people that run Ananda right now in Palo Alto, and um, furthermore that uh, it was a resource for a lot of people here in the, the you know, during the 60s when, well, well, you know, electric Kool-Aid acid test and when the Grateful Dead were in town. Uh, About 30 and seconds remaining. Finally, it was Feldman's books for the last 25 years. Jack Feldman ran a hell of a business here, and it's just been really important to a lot of community members. So, you know, maybe if the uh, owners on the side of their building, their new uh, apartment complex, if they want to put a little plaque saying what was here, that could be sentimental and, and kind, but otherwise, just want to thank everybody. And uh, yeah, that, that's the last word that we have to say on it. Or thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Um, Mr. Tabia, we have another speaker. Yes, uh, Chair Riggs, let me go ahead and introduce the next speaker. So, Fran Den, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. You should have the ability to activate your microphone. And if you could please state your name and the address or political jurisdiction in which you live in. Great, thank you very much. And it's Fran Dean. You're close, but Fran Dean. And uh, I'm with the Chamber of Commerce. And what I'd like to do is comment tonight on the project. We agree with the staff recommendation to approve the request for architectural control to demolish existing buildings, commercial buildings, and construct a new nine-unit, three-story residential building in the El Camino Real downtown specific plan zoning district. The project is consistent with the El Camino Real downtown specific plan, and importantly, it recognizes housing as a key element, a key need for Menlo Park. The proposed project application meets the criteria of SB 330 Housing Crisis Act of 2019. The housing units contribute to Menlo Park's arena quota 
including the now generous refinements that have been made to the BMR mix. And finally, the project does carry the recommended approval of the Housing Commission, very importantly. The applicants have proceeded through the required process over two and a half years, working with staff from concept design through the development of the proposed projects, participating in two study sessions to garner feedback and responding with creative solutions to those suggested modifications. And although, although the study sessions need not be a requirement for the project for the criteria of the specific plan, it was an important element and it provided us all the opportunity as they went public with the project design, allowing the community and the commission to evaluate and comment and potentially result in refinement of the design. And those refinements have been integrated into this final phase. The applicant listened, most importantly, the applicant has listed, listened and they have responded. And I believe they've met all of the planning commission's suggestive directions. And finally, I would also reference the current Merrill Street Santa Cruz Avenue project as a testament to the designed aesthetics and rejuvenation of Menlo Park through Prince Street Partners um, project, which is, well, pretty soon will bring us Bill's Coffee, among other things. Uh, really great, great thing. The project, this project repurposes the parcels along El Camino Real, echoing a creative response to the downtown specific plan goals. It's providing housing, it's providing all the commission's suggested improvements, and it will infuse a sense of modernity to the specific El Camino Real plan. We do ask that you move forward with the project and hopefully that will be your decision tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dean. Okay, so I will go ahead and introduce the next speaker Jeremy Ehrman, you should have the ability to activate your microphone. And again, please state your name and your address or political jurisdiction. Mr. Ehrman, do you want to try speaking and see if you're on audio? You may have to, uh, there's a microphone icon in a circle, and if it's not a green circle, then uh, you'll want to click on that to make it green. I believe Jeremy Ehrman's having some technical issues because his microphone is showing as active on my end, so it may be some technical issue on their end. If you like, I can go to the next speaker and then we can circle back. I think exactly. We'll, we'll uh, try you again in three minutes, uh, Mr. Ehrman. So uh, who have you got, uh, uh, Mr. Tapia? Okay, so I'll go ahead and introduce Zahara Argawal. Forgive me if I mispronounced that. So you should have the ability to activate your microphone now. And again, please state your name and address or political Hello. jurisdiction. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Zahara Agarwal, and I'm a high school student in Menlo Park. Um, I just wanted to reiterate what I think a previous speaker said about demolishing such a historical building. And while I fully support the idea of below market rate housing, I would urge the committee as well as the people um, facilitating this project to just recognize the a tremendous amount that Feldman's has contributed to this community and the people of Menlo Park. I think a plaque is a great idea. And I would also want the promise of the avocado tree in Mr. Feldman's yard to be followed through on. I think it's an important symbol of the dedication he has shown this community and is the least this commission could do for him. Um, I'd also just like to ask the question to those proposing the project as to sorry if I missed this, but if they have any plans to alleviate the noise that might be caused by having housing on such a busy street, I do know from firsthand experience that living on such large roads can cause a lot of noise in housing, whether you're sitting outside or just in your living room. So I was wondering if there were any plans to adjust, address that. Also as to just kind of how 
they would think that this housing is necessary right now, considering the amount of different projects and units happening in the El Camino area, area as well as all over Menlo Park right now, and kind of demolishing such a historic building for that purpose when there's so much already going on. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And um, let's give another try to Mr. Ehrman. Okay, so I'll go ahead and activate Jeremy Ehrman. Should have the ability to speak Hi, now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Jeremy Ehrman. I grew up in Palo Alto. I'm in Mountain View right now. I'm really, really disappointed to hear of this project. Um, I've been following it for several years. I really object. I think you should reject this. I urge the developers to withdraw it. The idea of tearing down historical buildings, and they are historical, whether you label them as such or not, they are over 100 years old. They are historical. How many buildings like there that are there on El Camino in Menlo Park? Um, and Feldman's Books is at the time, I, right now, I believe one of only two bookstores in Menlo Park. It's the only used bookstore. Um, it benefits not just Menlo Park, but the entire Bay Area, the whole community. There's very few used bookstores left in the Bay Area. And to have one that is in such a beautiful location as that building, I don't know if you've been there, you walk in, it's huge, there's thousands of books. And then you walk through an outdoor patio with a, a fountain and there's even a whole nother room, it's fantastic. Um, so the idea of replacing this, which the entire community can use, with nine apartments doesn't really seem like it's going to benefit people, especially now in the middle of the COVID pandemic when businesses have been, have been struggling um, and it's so hard um, for people to get by. Why would you take away half of the bookstores in Menlo Park? This really makes no sense. And I really decry this whole idea of we have to just tear everything down and make new things. No, preserve what's there. That is more important. Um, you know, three below market rate apartments out of nine, how is that going to really help things? Um, so I really urge you to keep the building and keep Feldman's. This is far more useful to the community than these buildings. And also the building you want to replace it with looks like every other building that's being built on El Camino. You go up and down the peninsula, it's all the same style, all the same colors, all the same designs. It's just, it's just really, really, really frustrating. I mean, here you have buildings that aren't the same, that are historic. So if I were a landlord, I would be thrilled to be able to own a building like this and a, a business like Feldman. So I really urge you um, to keep this and not to get rid of it. Um, and I'm really, really disappointed to hear people so excited to tear down historic buildings and get rid of um, one of the two bookstores in Menlo Park. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Ehrman. And Mr. Tapia, do we have another speaker? At this time, Chair, I can confirm there are no further speakers. All right, um, thank you. We've uh, we made our request uh, somewhere around 12 or 13 minutes ago. So I would like to think everyone has had an opportunity to indicate their desire to speak. Um, this would be your last moment if you want to click on that hand icon. All right, and seeing sure. none, yes. If I may, I do see several hands appearing from several of the commenters who already spoke. I believe there's a procedure regarding that. Uh, we only um, offer three minutes for each, um, uh, and, and we do not do repeats. Um, the hands may be um, uh, perhaps some form of reinforcement, but we, we limit public speaking to three minutes. That has been our tradition for quite a long time. So unless you see a, a new speaker other than those four, uh, any sign of that? I did see one briefly, but looks like they shied away. All right. Well, well, we have heard the four comments, <clears throat> um, so let us close public comment. Um, I will note that um, these issues have been on the minds of the commissioners uh, for three years <clears throat> and um, most likely still are in, in many cases. 
So uh, let's take this back up to the commission for comments on those issues or other issues. <clears throat> um, observations, um, suggestions. <clears throat> Do we have any comments? Mr. Ducardi, followed by Ms. Kennedy. You know, I went first last time. I'll defer to Ms. Kennedy and then follow up. All right. Ms. Kennedy. So I just want, thank you, Chair Riggs. So I just wanted to say that, um, I, you know, I this project has, has definitely, um, I think, been challenging for the community at large. And uh, But I appreciate that uh, Chase and Brady, the developers, have, you know, have made changes. That the, the building is, I think, um, a, a nice addition to that corridor. Uh, I, you know, I, I, the way in which they have adapted the rear community space, um, I do hope as well that folks do feel compelled to be out in those spaces. Um, I do think that there are not a lot of spaces downtown to go and sort of hang out. So um, I think that's kind of nice. I was just in the city the other day and was down on um, Fourth Street by Ch by the Chase Center, and there's a lot. There's quite a number of new little pocket parks, and they were full, right? And those are from the apartments right over there too, as, as well. So those it was really nice to see. Um, I do have a question about those planner boxes on the front. Um, th those, you know, are those going to be maintained by the by the residents of those units, or it, are they going to be maintained by the, the building somehow, because um, nothing is worse than seeing, you know, a beautiful building with really nice potential for window boxes, and then there's dead plants or no plants or just stuff hanging out the side of it, right? So that, that, that could be a really bad look. There's a beautiful building on Guerrero between, I think it's 24th and 23rd in, in, um, in San Francisco, and it's very similar to the style of your building, and there are those window boxes, and what they put in there they self-irrigate. So if that's also, if that could be part of it, that sort of protects the sort of like needing to water and that things dry, you know, dry out and die. And also um, El Camino is a pretty aggressive landscape for, uh, for balcony plants of any type. But um, I think it's a great project. I'm excited to see it. Um, I also feel like these developers, they build quickly. They build, they build quality, they build quickly. The pro, you know, the, the sites are clean, the, the projects go up. And you know, if everybody could build like that, it would be terrific. So that's all. Um, perhaps a response from um, the, the Prince group uh, regarding the uh, landscape planters, but the raised planters, I'm sorry. Yeah, hi there, uh, very, very good question. And um, we would love to have irrigation built into each of those individual planters. Um, if you look up at our planter system on the 1125 Merrill building, uh, there are similar planters, a little bit larger, but all irrigation is built in to where it's all automatic and uh, the cost would be put into the HOA. And so tenants would be required to pay for it, but it would be a part of the irrigation system. So um, we would hope that you're not looking at something that is aesthetically not pleasing. Perfect, thanks. thanks. All right, so Mr. Ducardi. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I have some questions around the the sort of bringing to a, at least in my mind, a closer and understanding of uh, uh, tearing down a building of historical significance. And I appreciate the additional background material in the staff report is very helpful in this mix. Um, so first, um, for the applicant, uh, the question: How long have you owned the property? <laughs> And when you purchased the property, was there anything in uh, the disclosures that uh, told you about the historical significance of the buildings or anything that um, might pertain to that historical significance? Yeah, uh, we have owned the building for a little bit over three and a half years, um, and there was no historical significance when we bought the building. So there's nothing, there's no disclosure, there's nothing in the sale and in the transfer to deed to say anything about the historical significance. Terrific, no. thank you. Um, and then you may be able to answer this, the city may be able to answer this, but the uh, because the BMR housing here is tied to other projects, um, you've got a, a sort of a hook uh, that I understand is a two-year hook that these uh, this these units need to be completed and filled within two years uh, 
uh, being able to then um, operate the other buildings. And if I have that right, my question for you is, where are you on that calendar? Like, you know, how, how soon do you have to have this completed in order to get the viability that you anticipate from your other projects? Yeah, very good question. So the technicalities fall in that it's two years from CFO of the current train station project that we're completing right now at the corner of Maryland, Santa Cruz. So we have just gained TCO in all three projects and we're approaching CFO, uh, which is probably a month or two away. And then we have a two year timeline to build and occupy the first unit at 1162 El Camino. So uh, if we gain approvals tonight, we would probably take till about August to get building permits if all went as planned. And then we would build the project starting August and should probably take us 10 to 14 months to build this project. Terrific, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, then I have a follow-up question based on this for staff, which is <clears throat> if, the, uh, if this commission decided that there was further inquiry into the historic significance, this would be a focused EIR. How long would a focused EIR take to complete and what would happen with that focused EIR? Um, yes, good question, uh, Commissioner. So with a focused EIR, it does take quite some time. It is a lengthy process and a costly process as well. Once the focused EIR is completed, we would have to have a uh, potentially a scoping session. And after that, we would also require a public comment of the EIR before we can move to a final approval of the project. I appreciate that. Thank you. I would just I suppose I'll just note rather than asking people to answer, but it seems to me that moving to a focused DIR and completing that focused DIR would start to run into some significant concerns based on the uh, connectivity between these projects for the applicant. Um, maybe that's just a, a comment for me in this uh, in this point. So then, um, uh, for, first of all, I appreciate Mr. Stone and and um, would just echo the thanks to to Mr. Feldman and the commitment to the bookstore. And it's clear from our previous um, conversations how deeply tied to the community and how caring. I mean, we've we've heard from people all over the world. Uh, about Feldman's books, which is just an extraordinary credit to you and what you've presented and given to this community. Um, and I suppose, I'll be honest, it's a bit of a relief that you all have figured out a path through here that uh, you know you are you are satisfied with. Um, because, but for that relief, you could imagine we've been having a very tense conversation tonight that would tie back into the historical significance of this building as a mechanism to try to protect Feldman's books because that's where we were last time. And I want to stress that from a planning commission standpoint, I think this is a hugely frustrating position to be in. We've got three experts with very detailed reports, two of which say that the building is not historical significance, and the other one says that it is. They're using the four-point criteria from the state, looking at the third one, which is essentially that it has some sort of unique architecture that is of importance to the community, X, Y, and Z. Um, there is the potential that the community can actually could go further in criteria for historical protection than the state, but the, this community has no criteria. So what we are faced with now is dueling points of view from experts about whether this building is of historical significance or not. Um, and we have zero criteria in order to be able to make that assessment. We also don't know basic things like Mr. Ehrman's question, which is how many hundred year old buildings are there on El Camino in Menlo Park? So this is simply um, not a good way to do public policy and not a good way to make a decision. So as we move forward tonight, what I would strongly urge is that as a commission, whatever we do with this project, we also append to it a very strong letter to the city council that they have essentially dodged a huge headache for themselves and that they should not let this happen again. And that means they should move to appoint a fair an expeditious process for determining what additional criteria the city of Menlo Park should consider for protecting buildings of historical significance. So there is explicit, clear, uniform, transparent, and fair criteria for this situation to come up again, because this is not a good thing to put a planning commission in the middle of. It's not the right venue. This is a city council venue, and we need to have more, um, more guidance as a city on this. So. Um, to my fellow commissioners, I hope you will agree on this, and I would at some point ask staff how we can make that strong recommendation to the city council. If we do not do this, this is going to happen to us again uh, in some way. 
Uh, and then uh, my final thing is, is um, uh, I just really want to thank Ms. Agarwal for your um, contribution. Uh, we also got a letter from a member of the Stork Association also suggesting a plaque. I'd, um, first of all, I'd like to say to Ms. Agarwal, there are many um, commission openings in the city of Menlo Park right now, and I would encourage you to apply and to participate. I think your voice on a commission would be fabulous. You were terrific in the arguments that you made. That's an aside. Um, but to the applicant, um, I wonder if you would be amenable to helping to work with the Historic Association in Menlo Park to put an appropriate plaque that recognizes the significance and the history of this building and that it would be placed somewhere on the site so that people could know what was there and what that history was. Is that something you would be amenable to doing um, as part of approval of this project? Well, that's yeah. a question for you, Chase, yes. Yes, we, we would be more than um, happy to uh, do that on this project. Terrific. So uh, for me, for the rest of the project, I'm a huge fan of the BMR. I appreciate you all working on that. I do think that I appreciate the comment that it doesn't seem like it's a lot, nine units, three BMR, but we need every single one we can get in this community um, and appreciate that and support it. And for the housing, I also think that um, the design changes that you've made that others have referenced, and I'm sure we'll have other commissioners that will ask you about those, but for me, those look completely supportable. So um, thank you for your effort and diligence on this project being before us many times on this. Uh, and with those two points that I'd like to make on the historic preservation, one, the comment to city council that they get criteria in place, and then the other one, putting an appropriate plaque in place, um, I'm supportive of this project. All right, very good. Um, other commission comments? Mr. Kale. Thank you. I'm not sure if I want to follow that impassioned speech, but I'll I'll give it a shot. Um, I want to start with a just a quick question uh, to the staff, a uh, clarifying question, if I may, to the chair. Please. Um, just to be clear, are we uh, allowed to talk about the design aspects of the project, being that it's a housing project? That wasn't entirely clear from the staff report. Um, no, unfortunately, we cannot discuss the uh, project discuss, uh, design through SB 330. Okay. All right. Um, I, I, sorry. Through the chair, if I can just add a little bit to that. I think there, there can be some discussion. Anything that would reduce a unit or make the project financially infeasible um, would not work with SB 330. But I think there's some leeway if the commission wanted to add a condition to change one of the materials or something like that. Okay, thank you. Um, then uh, I would like to ask the applicant a few questions about the design. Um, and I wanted to start with the, uh, the, 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 the garden space in the back. My understanding was that this was private space only for the residents, but it sounds like this may be a public space. Um, can someone clarify that? Yes. Um, no, this is private space for the residents. So everyone does have their own separate balconies, which is private, but this is public space within the project, but no no one from the public can come into the project. Okay. Okay. Um, then I had some questions about the materials themselves um, with the architect. Um, I wanted to ask about the the materials selection, um, I'm not quite sure how to put this, but to me, it seems like there are maybe, it, it seems a little too busy. Uh, it seems like there's perhaps one too many materials for given the, the short length of street frontage we have, I see four dominant materials. And I was just wanted to ask why that selection and is there, an opportunity to address that. Yeah, hi, this is Toby. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we we could address that. And again, this was, uh, you know, these materials were uh, coordinated with the town and, and with Arnold as the consulting uh, architect. I think we were trying to identify uh, a look for this property that, you know, broke this building down into kind of the aesthetic of you know four buildings and so i think it had a intent to create a kind of individuality to an extent uh, for each of those forms um i think we would be open to 
trying to simplify that. Um, although I think in our previous efforts, we received comments that uh, by not differentiating the materials enough, at, at one point we think we had the, the lighter stucco tone also repeating uh, on the far right-hand side. And uh, I think the comment from the town was that um, it, it sort of detracted uh, and didn't quite identify in the architecture the intent of the modulation under the specific plan. I, I appreciate the idea of, to separate this into four buildings, and I, uh, I support that. Um, I'm just thinking about the four major materials you have, plus you have the, the stained um, soffits and the metal part of the gate and, and some other elements. Um, if it was, this is my opinion, of course, if it was up to me, I would perhaps look at getting rid of the brick and just making that that center stucco more dominant. I'm comparing this to the rear elevation, which I think is actually um, a little more um, successful. And then it has sort of two major elements to it and it reads better than, than this. Feels like there's a lot going on given that it seems like this, the amount of materials here should be over a much larger street facade than what we have here. So um, I'm not sure how to pr propose this, but my thought would be to um, reduce the amount of materials and perhaps um, some other commissioners may want to weigh in on that as well. Um, I do, I, I agree that I that the canopy that was um, previously proposed was actually a nice addition to it. I'm sorry to see that go. Um, I have a question. I saw something in the staff report about the materials uh, turning the corner and I couldn't find that on any of the drawings, but the the note was something to the effect that the the side elevations will be visible from El Camino, and therefore the materials wrap the corners some distance. But I, I could not find what what distance that was or how that actually worked. Is there a drawing that you could point us to that shows that? Um, I don't know that we have this in our presentation. I don't know if staff can pull up the uh, submittal package, um, but the side elevations do show that that material turns the corner so that they're not perceived as you know two-dimensional applique um, uh, facade materials, uh, but rather characterize the form of the building. Um, we'll have to pull up that specifically to show you uh, how far back that wraps. I could make reference uh, if it helps. It's uh report sheets F28 and F29, otherwise known as architectural sheets A4.1 and A4.2. And they do indeed show the stucco wrapping, for example, on the Southwest elevation, just a little bit more than 50% and uh, enclosing a, a distinct form. And the same thing on the northeast elevation um so i think mr kale would be reassured that the materials are um related to distinct blocks rather than randomly changing um or stopping at a uh, you know say a 14 foot from the front facade random line i i see that now thank you for pointing that out and i i agree that works well um so my last comment was just on the uh, appreciating the BMR and also uh, I, I fully support the idea of a plaque for this site. I think that would be a, a great idea for tying some of the past into what's what, what's being proposed here and having that located at this site rather than elsewhere. Um, so that's my comments and I'm curious if anyone else had any similar concern about the, the facade. Others? Uh... To, to comment on the facade. All right, well, I will uh, I will weigh in. There were just a couple of comments that uh, I had, and I, I wanted to start with my observation that um, I, I actually find that uh, all three versions, or uh, two plus an adjustment, um, were well thought out and uh, and well done. Um, and I think we ended up with the current version with the, um, uh, at least in part, for an, in, uh, an intent to have uh, identified home spaces, be that, 
you know, correct or incorrect, um, modern or 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 throwback. Um, I um, also support the concept of a plaque or mounted images. Uh, I mean, there could be a, a triptych of photographs, for example. We hardly ever see photographs of late 19th century Menlo Park because there wasn't much to see. Um, but it is certainly notable to, to see uh, a wide dirt street with what looked like Western frontier storefronts uh, to to a degree. Um, I guess they're early 20th century, the ones that have the uh, uh, early Fords and such uh, on the street. <clears throat> um, so perhaps um, we might, as a group, encourage that some form of presentation, be it a plaque or a series of uh, permanently framed uh, photo images, uh, but with the, the purpose of honoring the past and the store, I think. Um, and then uh, I agree with Mr. Kale regarding the uh, loss of the front awning. Uh, and we can call it an awning that um, strong horizontal line. And I recognize that it was appropriate and necessary for staff to call that into question um, because the modulation uh, terminology, uh, as we have learned uh, with project after project coming before us with uh, vertical sections recessed in the middle of the facade, uh, in a, a, a very uh, formulaic manner. The <clears throat> specific plan drives uh, certain forms and limits certain options. We did see one building in um, uh, the, I guess it was the RMU zone over east of 101 that found an alternative way to address that um, and benefited, I think, from our support. In this case, I would like to ask staff what um, staff and Mr. Mamarella, um, what they would think of uh, an interpretation, a somewhat looser interpretation of the guidelines that would allow the awning in that the forms behind it seem to be quite strong enough um, and that um, the awning actually stands as a diminutive counterpoint. Um, so um, if, if I could ask either Ms. Khan or Mr. Amarello to, um, to share their thoughts on whether perhaps uh, allowing the architects their preferred um, detailing of the facade would would not damage the uh, image along El Camino and might perhaps even support a design intent. I don't know who would like to answer. Well, uh, I, I will start and then um, I can pass it over to um, Ms. Khan to, to, to finish the question. So the um specific plan for the modulation it says that the modulation has to run through the building vertically uh, on on the facade and that's where we've been caught up in this question that you're you've pointed to um on this project as well as a few others hmm. and there is an allowance that the staff has made to have canopies that are wholly within within the modulation and then the, the issue has become when the canopy or some other object extends through the modulation. So in, in other words, some people were coming in with like balconies and things that were filling the modulation. Staff was concerned that the modulations didn't get refilled with other stuff. Mm. And they wanted to, to have the modulations received. The canopy itself uh, could be placed within the modulation, but not extending across the facade horizontally and still meet the specific plan. For the looser in interpretation, I think that would be up to staff to work with you to accept if there's a looser interpretation of what they have now on a canopy 
or some other object that's allowed to extend across the facade beyond the, the modulation and still meet the um, standard. Is, oh. it, is that sufficiently clear in terms of this? Oh, I, th I think for the position, which I sort of understand the position staff is in, um, but um, uh, we are um, fortunate to have you and your uh, architectural opinion as well. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of uh, the somewhat more narrow focus of, is it uh, a lesser building, a better building, or at least as successful a building with the architect's preferred canopy? Um, because I wouldn't want to um, suggest something that um, uh, other uh, design reviewers felt was in, in detriment to El Camino Real. Um, so yeah, I, do you yeah, think I think it's a, a possibility aesthetically, perhaps even a positive to, to have that line? I just think if you're looking at purely from canopy or no canopy, has they presented the two options? The one with the canopy, most people uh, look at it and say that it does fit well. So it's just a matter of the technicalities of the uh, code. I, th right. I think the question might be come around, you know, how these things might grow over, over time with other, other proposals to get bigger and bulkier things. So if it's a very narrow, thin canopy, you know, that might be something that the commission might recommend is to set, that, that there's more leeway placed on that. We are fortunate in that uh, most of our approvals here at the commission include a paragraph, something like, uh, this is not to be interpreted as a uh, uh, um, precedent, um, which I think is probably wise since uh, we may uh, make one mistake for every two successes. I, have, uh, I, I haven't been keeping count and I don't intend to. Um, but I appreciate that uh, that observation. I, I think I will then uh, turn to Ms. Khan, um, or if you prefer, Ms. Zandemeyer, um, and ask if um, the administration of our um, specific plan could leave room for the architect's preferred design. Um, and maybe I'll prejudice this just a little bit in in noting that on um, Santa Cruz, we have, although you may have to go back a couple of years, we have actually urged um, uh, applicants to maintain a canopy line um, uh, for one reason or another. So I should let you speak. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I think, this is probably something that's better done through, you know, when we come forward with a specific plan amendments, because we've applied it one way to a large number of projects. So um, I'm not sure how that exactly works. Um, in general, if someone wants to alter a guideline for a specific project, then it would be done kind of through a variance. So since that wasn't applied for in this case, um, I do think it's safer to apply the guideline as we've applied it to other projects. Could I just clarify, is, is a canopy actually the level of a variance in this case, or, or is this an interpretation, which is, uh, you know, part of our part of our job really, um, I mean, together with staff. Is this not an interpretation, not really? Uh, I mean, we're not adding uh, a, a thousand square feet. Um, we're not um, uh, creating a new material. Um, could this be more handled more at an interpretive level? Well, I suppose it could be considered an interpretation, um, but the way, as I said, it's been applied to so many projects. I'm not sure if there's, um, obviously I'm not an attorney, but I don't know if there's a legal risk to kind of make an exception for one project. Um, 
and so, as I said, I, I think it would be safer to bring this forward as a um, specific plan amendment when we do go forward with amendments. Um, that could be one of many. All right, thank you. Um, I can't help but be um, a little bit blunt on this. Uh, this is actually uh, a specific plan amendment that I first ad asked for somewhere around 2016. And um, I explained the background on it and the repetitive um, formulaic forms that were coming forward. And I was told at that time that perhaps this should be part of a specific plan amendment. We've had at least one, perhaps two specific plan reviews in that time, and this has not been addressed or even agendized. Um, so I hope you'll forgive me if um, I suggest that uh, when we come up with a matter of aesthetics on a project that is going to be on El Camino Real, and that is a subtle enough issue um, in interpretation to the specific plan that perhaps we might do it the other way around and express a preference or acknowledge the architect's preference. And if the city attorney feels that they need to bring a hammer down on an awning, then perhaps that correction could be made to our approval in the future. Um, Understood. All right, thank you. I, I may not get support because this is a, a relatively targeted uh, aesthetic image and I, um, I am perhaps a little more sensitive to um, an architect's design, um, design intent. Um, but um, I, uh, I would like to see that. And I do think we have a relief valve in that um, if the city attorney says, well, everything works from the planning commission, except they weren't supposed to say that, um, that that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna be so bold as to um, make a motion to approve this project as presented with um, the, um, and, and I'll leave this up to other commissioners to express an opinion, but perhaps we can uh, simply acknowledge the spoken commitment of the developers who have already shown over the last four years, uh, um, I think quite a bit of uh, concern for our town and good faith that uh, as as promised, they would produce um, a plaque or some other <clears throat> uh, similar level graphic uh, to honor the historic nature of 1162 and of the uh, presence and importance of Feldman's bookstore. And that <clears throat> additionally that <clears throat> um, the uh, inclusion of an awning uh, could be allowed up uh, at the architect's discretion, as, as I've heard that was their preferred plan. And a couple of commissioners have, uh, including myself, have uh, expressed that actually perhaps the project was better with it. Um, to, uh, to include that in their project, pending, of course, any action or, or inter reinterpretation from our city attorney. Um, and if that's if that's not too spicy for um, our commission members, I'll, I'll ask if there's a second. <clears throat> Sorry to interject, uh, Chair, if I may. Yeah, please. Yeah, so we received a public comment that was written in through our question field, and it looks like it came in as a timestamp that came in right as we closed the public comment. So I was wondering if we could read that comment for the record. I think that would be appropriate if it came in just as we closed, yes. Okay, Thanks. so yeah. <clears throat> the commenter's name is Tim Johnston and the comment I will read verbatim, it says, representing the MPHA, 
we would respectfully request that the Prince Group seriously consider a wall plaque recognizing the historical significance of this building. So that was the comment that was submitted. And that's from our historical association? I believe so. Correct. It's the president of the Miller yeah. Historical Association. Yeah, that's right. All right. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, that came in and you were able to read it. Mr. Barnes. Chair Riggs, uh, allow me, if you would, a couple of thoughts on this agenda item. Uh, you know, this is as difficult a decision now as it was back then, and we've seen it, what now, three times. Um, a couple of my thoughts on this is, <clears throat> excuse me, essentially important things happened at this location, uh, but I don't consider this a historic building. You know, I find the historic evaluations, I'm not myself conflicted on the historic evaluations. I, in looking through the three evaluations, I find the city and the applicants historic elevation evaluation to be persuasive, uh, less so uh, the original one. And I do look at the comments that were made uh, about the first one and find it um, again less persuasive so I, i'm not conflicted that uh, although important things happened here it's not necessarily a historic building and i think that's our charter as the planning commission as we look at um, the fact that uh, you know our our charter is to make the determination uh, not on whether it's a beloved business but whether it's a historic building uh, so I go back to the rights of ownership as being the prevailing right uh, and the guidepost for what direction I take on this particular project. Um, I'm not in fact swayed by the BMR units on this site. I mean, it is the responsibility of the applicant to provide for their new development uh, in Menlo Park and if these BMR units don't go in this building, they have to go to another building. So there will be the delivery of these two BMR units that are related to their other project. And if they don't go to this building again, they can put them in their current building. They can figure out where to put them. So this is, I don't want this to get colored as a uh, public good delivering BMR units out of thin air. The, this is a responsibility of the applicant pursuant to entitlements which were provided on uh, different projects. And one that accrues as a result of this building is, of course, welcome uh, in any context. Uh, but I want to separate that delivery of BMR units as being anything other than their responsibility. And I'm also you know, not persuaded by uh, the fact that they need to deliver this in a certain time frame. That's more their problem than our collective problem. If, in fact, this project, if, in fact, there was a need for an EIR on this project and it took the time, then that should be a road that we go down. And, and, and if it does uh, create a challenge for the applicant in delivering their units, again, that's not the um, purview of this commission. That's the timing of how they've chosen to structure their developments within this city. Um, so I wouldn't let that dissuade us from this if, in fact, that is something that folks writ large feel is you know appropriate to, to go down this path. I don't, but I don't. I won't chime in that I don't think that should be dissuasive of going down that route and timing associated with it. Um, you know, I guess I'll get back to this beloved business, but not historical building. I mean, I guess the unfortunate nature of it is with all the vacancies available on Santa Cruz Avenue, uh, if you're looking for a business that can generate foot traffic both for the good of Santa Cruz Avenue, for the good of its business, chances are it's a better location to be on Santa Cruz Avenue. Um, so I, I don't know that um, they'll be in a less desirable location from a foot uh, traffic standpoint if they went to any of the uh, locations, uh, locations on Santa You know, that's their pick. Um, 
so for that reason, uh, I'm supportive of this, but I'm also weighted by the importance of what Feldman has meant to the community. But that doesn't, uh, in my mind, outweigh the rights of ownership on a building which is deemed not to be historic, um, in my mind, and based on the, the evidence that was presented on multiple uh, occasions. So I, um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right, thank you for that insight. Um, any other comments on the project or uh, we have a motion on the table, but no second. So either a second or another motion. And I'm sorry, may I ask as a follow-up? Uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Dorn, I didn't mean to jump in front of you. If, if you would, uh, Commissioner Riggs, be so kind as to articulate what Outside of the staff report and approval of the, the the staff report, what were your riders on that that you were adding as amendments to the conditions for approval? Yes, thank you. I'd be happy to. Uh, the only condition uh, for approval was an allowance for the previously presented canopy pending review by a uh, legal counsel of our specific plan. Uh, I should... Meaning um, that the architect had expressed concern and a couple of commissioners had expressed regret at its loss and that um, I'm not overly inclined, I'm not inclined at all to say it shall have the canopy, but I am inclined to say um, if the architect of record would prefer to see it, and there is certainly sympathy among the two architects on the commission um, that that uh, I think would be an appropriate option for the final approval. Uh, I'll say that I'm in support of that. I was surprised to see the canopy go, and uh, I certainly think it adds uh, an architectural component that's accretive to the building. So I uh, will uh, second your motion uh, and in there, there's nothing explicit about a plaque or other reference to the side of the building. If some other commissioner wants to you know, offer friendly for that, I you know, would certainly be open to listen to that. But as it relates to the uh, motion that's on the floor, I'll second it. All right, thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Ms. Rank. Thank you, Chair Riggs. I'm, I would just like to get a little bit of clarification on this um, addition of the canopy language. We don't want it in any way to be tied to any sort of future specific plan amendment. So is this something that we will work in consultation with staff and Arnold on as we move forward to building permit? Just wanted to make sure that we're clear on that direction. Thank you. Um, hmm. Good clarifying point. Um, yes, I think it would be appropriate for us to say, um, as we often do, uh, to uh, coordinate with staff. Um, <clears throat> and the only thing that this commission is offering is a um, loosening of the interpretation that uh, led to its removal. Is is that is that clear enough? Yeah, that makes sense. As long as we uh, are sure that that gets reflected in the uh, the final condition, that sounds good to me. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, through the chair, I did have one question. So, um, was there a specific version that this canopy was in? I don't know if that was in the in the architect's presentation. Is there a description of the canopy that we can include in the um, in the condition? Um, we we have most recently seen it in the presentation tonight as the uh, former um, uh, former presentation. Um, so I will leave it to uh, to the architects to define what date that was. And then, um, as noted, and, and part of the reason for a staff and a consultant to be able to coordinate this is, of course, at our level, we're not looking at the 
brackets that connect the canopy back to the building. We're not looking at the underside. We're not looking at the uh, whether the screws are shiny or black. Um, and you might not either, but uh, I'm um, hoping to uh, act here in the larger uh, uh, policy and interpretive uh, nature of the commission rather than the specific review that the staff has been doing so well on major projects. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Pleasure. And uh, Mr. Doran. Yeah, I just wanted to add a few comments before we vote. I think, uh, by and large, I agree with Commissioner Barnes. Uh, I would like to just discuss for a minute, uh, before we get to a vote, uh, the question of the historical status of the building. I, I think that there's been, understandably, a great desire to preserve Feldman's books. Uh, and I think that that's colored the consideration of whether this is a historical building or not. Um, I don't think it's a historical building. I don't think that every uh, old building is historical. I believe, in the absence of any clear requirement of criteria to, to apply to the building, which we don't have, um, that a building is either historical because of the building itself, because of some quality in the structure, generally architectural, or because of something that happened there. I think the building itself, although it's old, is is not noteworthy. There's no architectural interest in this building. There are lots of buildings like this around the Bay Area uh, and other parts of the country. So I don't think there's a case to be made. In my view, there's nothing significant about the structure that would make it historical. So the other question is, what happened at the building? Okay, I understand it was a market in the early days of Menlo Park. Uh, and that there aren't very many buildings surviving from the early days of Menlo Park. But the other, the, the, the main argument for this building being historic seems to be that the Stanford had a laundry done there. And I just think that's totally inadequate. You know, we've, if, we want, if we want memories of Jane Stanford, uh, we go a mile down the road, and there's much, much more to remember her by that I think is more noteworthy architecturally and historically. So I think it's a real stretch in my mind to say this is a historical building. And I think that a great deal of the effort around that has been due to the desire to preserve Feldman's books. I think they're separate issues and we should keep them separate. Um, beyond that, I don't have a lot to add to Commissioner Barnes' uh, observations and I'm in favor of this project. All right, thank you. And Mr. DeCardi. Yeah, so um, it, on the question of the plaque, um, could I just ask the applicant directly if they are um, amenable to working with Mr. Johnson as the chair and the historic association to come to an agreement about um, the appropriate scale size depiction of the plaque that fits with, uh, you know, the, the historic association's history in Menlo Park and yeah. reaching a successful agreement supporting that? Is that, are we good? We're good. We're good. We've done plaques before on many buildings and uh, I feel very confident that we can uh, design something and implement something that will achieve everything we've discussed tonight. So we're not opposed to this at all. Okay, I'm not. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit with Mr. Barnes. I'd be fine with a friendly putting that into this motion, but I don't need to have it in the motion given the history and the ties that you have with the community and your verbal commitment to work to make that happen. And really appreciate that. So, so thank you. Um, and then I'd like to uh, then come back to the questions I asked at the beginning, I guess, and to Mr. Commissioner Barnes and Commissioner Doran's comments. Um, the only um, discrepancy between all of the uh, reports we've read, including the one that just came to light that was in favor of uh, the historic significance of the building, is actually the structure of the building, not, a, not the history of the use of the building at all. So um, I too am not moved by the history of the use of the building. 
Um, uh, and that's both its current occupant and all the way back to whoever did their laundry there 120 years ago. Um, however, if we're looking at the staff report and we're looking at um, the two distinctions that they lay out, which I think are well said on page nine, um, it does say that the Planning Commission has the space to find that this is of significance to local people. Uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, that, well, what I believe is that we don't have enough information as a Planning Commission to actually know because we have no criteria and we actually have no information about the presence of this type of building in the rest of our community uh, to be able to base that on. And so for me tonight, if there had been 50 people who had come and shown up and said they believed this building had historic significance as a part of Menlo Park, that for me would have been a very important representation of local interest in this building. Now, we didn't get that tonight, and I also agree that to the extent that we heard that previously, it was very tied to the Feldmans and the current occupant. Um, so I am supportive of this project, um, but it is not as cut and dried for me for those reasons. And therefore, it is why I think it is really important to send with this approval to the city council, and I'd ask staff how to do this, a companion request that the city council act to provide greater criteria for when a building in Menlo Park should be considered historic um, that goes above and beyond what is the state statute on this. Um, or to assume that if they don't do that, then we have no additional criteria locally. But right now we're moot on that. And I think that, um, is too wide latitude for interpretation given the lack of facts and information that we're working with. So that's the reason why I believe it's important to go to the city council and ask for them to push for clarification on the criteria. All right, thank you. Mr. Barnes. So thank you, uh, Mr. DeCarty. Those are some important points. Uh, let me just think out loud and think back. If and I'll circle through the chair to staff to see if there's any historical knowledge on this. I remember maybe the first time this came around, there was the ability for Menlo Park to create. There's always the ability, and there was it was articulated there that there was the ability for Menlo Park to come up with these criteria. But two things were gating factors. One is it was just work, right? Uh, not an insignificant amount of work for the city to undertake that for what was a relatively small stock of buildings that could potentially be historic. Now, again, I'm not saying it's a good or a bad idea or a bad idea, but that was, I think in the past, what was raised. And the other thing is that the, the existence of best practices which exist in other communities. So it's not reinventing the wheel, whether it's Redwood City or whether it's Palo Alto, there are other communities which have these particular criteria, and there could be, in terms of efficiency, adopting that. And I remember the, one of the gating issues being there just isn't enough in Menlo Park to make it worth a while. Uh, so that's my memory of what that process was. I think it's a valuable process, and I also think uh, somewhere someone's got to make a determination of do we have the staff time and the ability to do that, and is it worth it? I, I'm, that's not my call, but I think it's certainly a, a uh, call worth we're worth having. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, we did have at the first meeting 50 people. What felt like 50 people show up for this particular building, and I and I think what is important to keep in mind is is there recency bias? So is there a an affection for the current operator doing what he does now currently? And is that a 10 or 15 year old affection? And how does that sit in the context of a building that's 100 years old? And if we're looking at it from a historical standpoint, you know, uh, I was never comfortable letting recency bias take over the discussion of historic. And those two things um, being very different for me as, as someone who was looking at the issue. So I offer those two points for, for whatever they were. Thank you. 
Um, before we go further, I would like to just remind the commission of a discussion that we had it's either two weeks ago or four weeks ago having to do with the efficiency of our discussions and uh, focusing on the um, um, immediacy of our task. So if I may, I would just like to test the waters by asking for a show of hands, uh, how many would uh, like to call the question? And, and for those who haven't recently read Roberts, that means move directly to a vote. Uh, so uh, are, are we about done with um, discussing the details of this? All right, just I, I expected one more, but uh, so we we have four members who have indicated it, it might be time to vote. Um, can I leave? Uh, can I suggest a one-minute comment uh, more from each of the three people who did not vote to poll to call the question? Um, and starting with Mr. Kale because he had his hand raised. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I just um, agree with. Uh, <clears throat> all my fellow commissioners in the recent comments, especially with uh, Commissioner Doran's comments about the historic nature of the building. It's had so many alterations that um, it's hard to support that as a historic uh, building. Um, I wanted to um, say that, you know, reiterate that I believe the, the design is nice. I would appreciate uh, more careful attention to the materials, but I can support the project. And the last, item was uh just want to clarify the motion i know that the that the canopy or the awning is part of that did i hear that the plaque was part of that motion or not it is not part of the motion uh, there were three uh commissioners who said um they felt that they had heard enough commitment tonight um from the applicant uh to feel confident that that plaque will happen okay thank you i'm prepared to vote all right, and Ms. Tate, did you want to uh, speak on this issue? Um, I just feel that we talked about this previously, about the whether or not the building was historic and about the turnout. So I feel, um, I do think that we have several things that come before us that we really do need to get clarity from council on. And this is, this is just another one. Um, and that's all I have to say. The project looks good though to me, and I do appreciate the three BMR units at, at um, very low and low. Thank you. Um, Mr. Barnes, do you want another minute? Uh, I will do two things. I'll cede my time to Commissioner DeCarty because I feel that his importance, his input is important and I would not like to see us rush to close this issue prematurely. Uh, I, I do not feel for the record that we need to pursue action from council, uh, but that said, I'll see whatever time I have left to Mr. DeCarty. Mr. DeCarty, did you want to speak no. further on this issue? No, I'm fine. I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate the points of view. All right, very good. I, I think we're ready to vote. Um, so um, I'll just say all in favor, uh, so indicate with the hand. And I love it when it's unanimous because I don't have to read any names. Uh, you have a unanimous approval, Mr. Rapp and Mr. First. Congratulations and thank you for your patience and which is no small item uh, when we're talking uh, about a development effort. And with your sensitivity to um, the city, um, both its environment and its process. Thank you and congratulations. No, thank you guys very much. We really appreciate it. And we're excited to be doing another project uh, in Menlo Park. And we hope there's many more to come in front of you guys. So thank you for tonight. We appreciate it. Very good. All right, so that concludes our regular business. And from that, we move on to information items. Uh, Ms. Sandemeyer. I need to apologize. I don't think I noted who who seconded the motion for the approval of 1162. Okay, Commissioner Barnes, thank you. 
Okay, so um, for the next meeting, we have a couple single family homes on the agenda, and then we also have the um, annual review of the development agreement uh, for the middle plaza at 500 El Camino Real project. And that'll be for the March 8th. And that concludes my updates, but I'm happy to answer okay. questions. Um, any questions about uh, either an upcoming meeting uh, or process? All right, and I'd like to add my thanks to Ms. Kennedy, who is on a, a schedule that is going to greatly limit her sleep tonight uh, prior to a meeting. And that's uh, the only thing worse than not being able to have dinner prior to a meeting. So thank you. And thank you all. <laughs> thank you all. And the meeting is adjourned at 9.55 p.m. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.